divide in the works of Muhammad Akhun, theological and interpretive questions in Islam must be read not only as textual issues, but also as political states. This is particularly true of the concept of reform, Islam, in the history of Islam, the concept that is originally at the heart of the Prophet's mission, I only came to reform, only do it as Islam, Islam, or the operation of reordering, correcting, and transforming, necessitates, by definition, an interpretation of the current situation and a vision for a future one. And as such, it is not only the aim of individual religious reformers who write essays and books, but also one of the purviews of the modern state that crafts policies. So in this presentation, I want to focus on the post-colonial state in Tunisia, to shed light on the ways in which state elites formulate principles for reforms of society and develop in the process reasonings and interpretations about religion, which produce in the very process specific domains of applicability for the system. I want to argue that in Tunisia, but also in many other Arab states, colonial state elites explicitly define the sphere in which religion could and should be activated in specific ways, and strive to create a public Islam under the quasi-monopoly of the state. Far from being secularist states circumscribing religion to a private domain, and here I'm, I'm in discussion with you, authoritarian Middle Eastern states therefore define themselves as Muslim states, and of course Tunisia in its own constitution, defined the state itself as a state whose religion was Islam, is Islam, and produced theological definitions that were instrumental in their enterprises of reforming their societies. To illustrate this point, I will focus on the case of the Tunisian post-colonial state, which has often been analyzed as having enacted policies shaped by a strong secularist ideology and relegated Islam to the private sphere. Positions of individual reformers and state officials on the subject of female veiling and unveiling will help me understand state reasonings and policies, what I could call here the reasons of the state. So I'm not using the raison of the enlightenment here, but what are the raisons d'état, that's in the plural, not the one raison d'état, but what are the reasons of the state? The reasonings that the state uses about proper ways to dress in relation to their understanding of the content of Islam, what Islam says and what it does not say. So there are a lot of reasonings about this does not belong to Islam, this does belong to Islam. And they're conferring to it functions, which means that these state elites have also reasonings about what Islam is here for, what are the aims of Islam, which goes back to world reformist trope, um, and I will come back to that a little bit later. The period I concentrate on starts in the end of the 1920s, when Tunisian nationalism against French occupation matures into an organized movement and ends in 1987, the year that marks the end of Habib Bourguiba's regime. I will focus in particular on Bourguiba's changing interpretations of veiling, which helps understand how the veil became a very complex and multi-layered political issue in Tunisia over the course of the 20th century. I will underline Bourguiba's continuity with Muslim reformist thought, in particular the Tunisian al tahar al-Haddad's writings dating back to the 1930s. And perhaps more surprisingly for me, but maybe not for you, but for me it was surprising to, um, to read um, the texts um, written by uh, Ranoushi uh, on women. Um, and so I will argue for continuities, in fact, between Bourguiba's ideas on women and Ranoushi's ideas and writings on women, which he produced in the 1970s. So first, to illustrate how Tunisian political elites have been deeply ambivalent on the question of the veil, I go back to the period of the 1920s, the so-called decade of the Battle of the Veil, La Bataille du Voil, in Tunisia, and particularly to a 1929 controversy in which Bourguiba, within the context of occupied Tunisia, took a position against the coup, against unveiling. And I contrast this position with that of uh, Tahar al-Haddad, uh, both Tahar al-Haddad's book, Ra'atuna fi sharia wal mujtama, our woman in Islamic legislation and uh, society that favored unveiling. Second, I explain Bourguiba's reversal of position, 
regarding the need after independence, and I compare it with Islamic Rashid Renouchi's interpretation in favor of the faith. And I argue that the Gida and Renouchi opposite positions on women's dress are in fact molded within similar reformist vocabularies regarding female subjectivity, women's place in the world, the intentionality of religious norms and that the state leader and the Islamic activists shared similar conceptions of religion as circumscribed domains of interpretation and ethics. So let me go back first to the controversy of 1929. On January 11, 1929, the Tunisien, a Francophone Tunisian nationalist journal, published an article written by Habib Urgiba, then a young nationalist activist and a member of the old Destour party. This article was his own account of a meeting held at Liso, a literary socialist club, where he participated in a heated debate with Tunisian and French socialists, among them Mohamed Norman and Joachim Buren, about the wearing of the veil by Tunisian women. During this debate, and again, this is the account by Bourguiba, but this is what interests me, Bourguiba defended the wearing of the face veil. So we have also to be careful when we talk about hijab, what type of hijab are we talking about? So at that time, in the I should have had a, a PowerPoint presentation with pictures. Um, but the, the veil basically is a face veil. So you have the, the haik or the sasari with a uh, harma or a litham um, overweight that you can um, play with too. And it's not so uh, inflexible. And so uh, he defends the wearing of the face veil, in particular against a certain miswatan. And so what is interesting here is that Bourguiba is really debating with women. Tunisian women at that time. And he accuses her of belonging to a group, and I quote, of heroic apostles of dress feminism, nos apôtres du féminisme vestimentaire, that was in, who were in fact supported by French socialists, right? Um, and so he, that, he added with a lot of irony, uh, citing another Tunisian young female activist, and I quote him, Miss Mancheri, Habiba Mancheri, a charming young lady, came her face uncovered and wanted to move us, nous attendons, about the fate of her unfortunate sisters who are deprived of air and light and live under the triple weight of ignorance, gossip, and the veil. Unquote. Manubia Wartani and Habiba Mancheri were indeed young feminist activists who, as early as 1924, had started to defend the possibility of unveiling and themselves appeared unveiled in public. If Bourguiba stood against them, it was not because he was against Sufur, but rather because he wanted to publicly defend what he called the Tunisian personality, against the colonizers' intent to westernize Tunisia, which was, of course, under French protectorate. For the Bourguiba of 1929, the veil could not be abandoned because it was a signifier of the identity of the nation. nation. Hence, to defend the veil was a way to perform an act of resistance against the colonizer. So Bourguiba used the veil as a symbol of the nation, as a sign. And I think that's important because he did not look at the veil as a freely chosen dress, and he did not look at the veil as a religious obligation. So in a way, his position of 1929 announces his post-colonial position on the veil. So he considered the veil as a custom, Ada that had been anchored in the practices of the national community for a very long time. Veiling had become for him part of the mores of his society. It was a symbol, and I quote him again, of what is most inherent, irremediably subjected to this group. What characterizes and distinguishes this group from all others, in a word, what makes its proper individuality, its personality. So we're back to the belonging uh, before. Uh, unquote. His reaction contrasted with other opponents to unveiling, who underlined that by abandoning the veil, Tunisian women would lose their respectability, fall into immorality, prostitution, and would lead Tunisian society toward more corruption and decline. These uh, intellectuals and, and political elites had described the veil as one of the devices protecting the moral and religious order of Tunisian society. And to abandon the veil, they argued, would lead to the degeneration of women, such as it had happened already in America and Europe. For Bourguiba, on the other hand, the veil was not a device protecting women and defending the integrity of a certain moral order. 
He did not pose the issue of failing and unfailing in religious or moral terms, but rather described it as a social problem. And that's also part of the um, discourse that really started to talk about religion as having a, a social function. So in his 1929 article, he wrote, I believe that it is relevant to look at the subject from a social point. So it's really looking at the veil almost as a anthropology, saying, well, it's there. Uh, I don't specific, specifically like it, but it's a sign of our personality. So since we are under colonization, we cannot abandon it. This is what he wrote. And I quote him again. We have in front of us a custom, anchored for centuries in our moors, evolving with them at the same pace, that is quite slowly. The mores of the group, be it the family, the tribe, or the nation, are what is most inherent, the most irremediably subjective, its, its personality. And then he asks, is it in our interest to hasten the disappearing of this veil? My response, given the very special circumstances we live in, is without doubt, no, unquote. The veil was in the words of Boogie, but already in 1929. The sign of women's unconscious activism, and I'm using his own words here, but it was a way of the colonized, and as such, it had to remain. So I'm going to um, to skip a few a few other quotes that are interesting. Um, so at this time, he's not really interested in the reform of Tunisian society, and he, even in this particular moment in 1929, he marks Ataturk, um, whom the young Tunisian feminists as a reference. Um, and on the other hand, he said, at the same time, evolution must happen, otherwise it is death. It will happen, but without a break, without a rupture. We must maintain in the perpetual evolution of our personality a unity to time that can be continued to pursue by our conscience. So abandoning the veil was really premature, even if he was already announcing that it would be necessary. So now let me move to another personality of the time, Etan al-Haddad, who was another Tunisian reformer, much less political, uh, who was educated at the Zaytouna. Well, of course, we all know that the Diva was uh, uh, educated at the Sadiqi College and uh, then as a lawyer in France. And um, the book by Etan al-Haddad is relevant for my argument because it contains a justification for unveiling that Bourguiba, in fact, will reassert after independence. So in fact, Haddad and Bourguiba are very close, but it's a Bourguiba of post-colonial times that is very close to Haddad. And why are they very close and why are they important for me? It's because they deploy an argument about Islam as a view, as a religion, that is a channel for reforming society. So what I find in Bourguiba after independence and in Haddad is that the deen has an instrumental value. It has a function. As such, it should have an impact on life. And there is a word that you find all the time in Haddad and Mugiba, is the word Hayat. And so when you read, and, and it's very, uh, it, it's quite quite fascinating how much Mugiba talked about Islam. He's supposed to be the most secularist of the Arab leaders, but if you look at his speeches, if you look at the whole, um, his course really, the whole comprehension of what Islam was, and the idea of religion du vécu, in a way, I, I lived religion or religion as part of Hayat was very, very important. And I think it was linked to the idea of personality and maybe also to his reading of Bergson. We should remember that he was in the 20s in Paris and uh, that the philosophy of Bergson and this idea of mechanism of, of culture and religion maybe had something to do with it. But that's something that will need more research and it's probably in detail. So let me go back to, um, to Haddad. Um, Haddad, in the beginning of his book, wrote a long meditation on Islam and its role in reforming society. He wrote, the reform of our social condition is necessary for all aspects of our life. And here you have Bourguiba announced already. And in particular, for what touches our existence in life, I see with certainty that Islam is not an obstacle against reform, as, left, as the accusations proclaim. On the contrary, it is the religion of reform, Dinu Bulkawin, and the inextinguishable source of reform. As for the decline of the Muslim world, it has no other cause than superstitions and customs that we have grown to life over a long time. Unquote. 
So had that developed the idea that Islam contained in its text the principles for reform of society and could help improve life. And this is not very, very different from what political Islam later will also develop, which is that religion means Islam and is dino and dunya. Of course, it will go another way politically, but uh, it's very close to this idea that religion is a principle of life. Haddad um, also wrote, Islam in its entirety is a, is a principle uh, guiding our lives. So it's, it, he's a reformist, he's considered a liberal reformist, but in fact he saw Islam in a very apologetic way as the basis for reform. He, he wrote it was a set of regulated principles that proved to be useful, and he uses the word distur. To, uh, he says Islam is a distur for life, right? And so again, we are in the time of the all these two parties, so it's not neutral um, for him. At the same time, and I find that very close also to the state reformers, what he did is develop a whole reasoning about what was part of Islam and was not part of Islam. And for instance, for him, the veil was not part of Islam. So not only Islam was necessary for life, but it had also to be circumscribed in its meaning. So there were a lot of practices that did not belong to it. So there was a circumscribing in the meaning of Islam. For instance, polygamy, the face veil, were not inherent to the to Islam. Just the Islam. So there were things that belonged to it and others that did not. And as a good reformist, he distinguished between the meaning and the essence, the shawhar, of Islam. So what does he say about hijab? At the very end of the book, which starts with a whole analysis of uh, women in Islam in a, in a sort of thirdly uh, legal type of analysis, he ends with the question of the world. And it is interesting to note that not only he, he talks as a legal scholar, he, he writes as a legal scholar, but also as an anthropologist, he describes in the second part of the of this book, um, in very vivid terms, the lives of women in Tunisian society, in their homes, with their children, outside, inside, and he's very critical of this type of life. He, um, he, he describes, for instance, polygamous family, he, he describes a bickering with wives, or, you know, when you have four wives, they bicker, between, they, they fight all the time, the kids are neglected, they go out in the street and they get into accidents, so he has a very miserable type of description of this poor Tunisian woman who's always abandoned, and um, I'm not reading the quotes, but, um, you know, and men, uh, in fact, there's a segregation within the home, uh, because you know, women and men are not in the, in the relationship of Islam and Mahabba, so the, uh, the, the, the husband has a private life outside of the home, a secret private life outside of the home, and the, the wife is neglected, um, and of course she's ignorant, uh, because she cannot go out, and she cannot take care of her own affairs. So there is, and we should not also forget that the Haddad wrote a, a book on uh, Tunisian workers, also where he described the very, very poor conditions uh, of Tunisian workers, so in a way the woman is represented as a victim in the same vein as the, the Tunisian workers. Um, so let me look a little bit at, at some of these quotes because some of them are, are symbolically very, very uh, quite, um, quite interesting. In the text that describes the veil as a, the device wrongly used to protect men and women from temptation. He talks about the material separation, I quote, um, also a separation between men and women that prevents them to know each other better in preparation of marriage, um, unquote, a social means against evil, he says. And his critique takes a symbolically harsh tone when he writes, and I quote again, there is not that big a difference between this thing women use to cover their faces, that is the niqab. So here he tells us exactly what he's talking about and the muzzle that we put on the dog so that it does not fight the passersby, and So in 1930, it's really like, you know, when I discover the text, I was like, well, Bulbiba has read the text, obviously, uh, and uh, he, will, he will use that, uh, that type um, of, of tropes. Um, so separation, closure, and the veil, of course, is particularly for Hadel, who was very interested in education and education of women. It was a device that really prevented women to know the world, not just to know scholarly knowledge, but also to know her husband. The idea that women and men could not know each other before marriage, for instance, was important for him. And of course, 
he's a reformist, so uh, he, he also, uh, when women go out, uh, it is usually to go to uh, visit the tombs of saints, right? <laughs> So he says, well, and in addition, they can even, you know, when they go out, you know, to do what? To go and visit saints. I mean, so for him, it's a real desolation. It's like the critique coming from a reformist, but the reformist is also an anti-Sufi and uh, close to, to some Salafi tropes in that sense that Islam has to rationalize, right? Islam has to rationalize and um, improve society, but also rationalize within itself. So there is no disinterest for Islam itself. Um, and the country, it is really an internal type of reform. So he talks about emancipation, tahrir, but this is not geared towards individualism or any liberal type of position towards women. Um, let me read a quote, I think it will be very clear. We would, be, we would only be able to remove the veil if it were lawful, decent, and moral. If it exceeds the bounds of what is required and its nakedness, revealing all limbs, the face, neck, chest, and breasts, uh, the adornment of these parts um, that lead to glances of love meaning in public in front of people, this could lead to lust and to attention and pursuit. This is a path taken by many young European women. It has a huge influence on the feelings of our young people and the way they are prepared for the future. So again, there, is, there are limits to this. Um, emancipation and, and he talks about the misunderstood modernism etc because he does not want either to see Tunisia fall into uh, western ways either so and Burkina would be very similar uh, you know giving speeches against the veil but also against miniskirts in the 60s um, so there is a certain dignity that women have to follow uh, and they also have responsibilities within the home so it's still a very patriarchal uh, vision of um, the role of women in society, and I'm not going to give you uh, quotes because um, I don't want to be part of my third section. So, uh, Tahir al Haddad was an individual thinker and scholar of Islam, and Burgiba was a political activist who became a statesman. So, what I'm interested in, in fact, is not in Tahir al Haddad himself, but how these ideas are going to be molded within the institution of the state. And what I'm interested here really is the reasoning, is in the reasoning of the, state, of the state regarding the veil. But before I do that, I would like to um, give you a little note about what Burgiba did um, regarding Islam right after independence, because I think it has to be understood in this particular context. He, first, Burgiba took the reins of the state. Um, authoritatively. I mean, he was very charismatic. He took over and imposed an incontested type of power on Tunisian politics and society. He imposed reforms um, of, of course, the personal status quo uh, in 1956 without any discussion. The drafting constitutional assembly were not, was not even finished. Um, so this was a decree imposed on Tunisian society. And of course, you probably know already everything that was done in the code, so I'm going to, uh, but the, the uh, polygamy was um, not uh, permitted anymore, divorces were in front of uh, courts, no more talef, uh, etc. So, um, so this is a quite reformist and, and modernist uh, code. Um, and then there is also the reform of the Zaytuna, uh, the elimination of the protect system, the Zaytuna, uh, 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 becomes a very small theological institute within the faculty and faculty the left in Tunis. Uh, the ulama are really traumatized by, by such a reform. It's a reform that is, um, that one could analyze as a real appropriation of all these institutions by the state. I and mean, the constitution of the state in the young religion. And of course, the habus, the alpaka, as we say in the mashrib, are also nationalized. The ideas that, that uh, Burkiba developed on women were uh, developed in this context and, um, and they were in a continuity with the code. So what I want to, to, to do is give you an idea of, of um, how he tried to convince Tunisians, and Tunisian women but also men, to abandon uh, the veil. Um, and he did this, I think, through two main channels. One is his, one channel is his speeches. Um, he was a very good speaker, so it's interesting to look at his speeches. And the second thing he did, which is quite fascinating, is unveiling women in the streets. 
Um, so I'll give you both uh, ideas on, on both of them. And this was really a public performance that served as a propaganda tool for Bungiba. In the speech of December 5, 1957, Bungiba tackled the issue of the state and linked, and I quote him, the country's prosperity and the individual's liberties to the existence of, a, and I quote again, a strong state deeply rooted in the hearts. So what he does very often is talk about the strength of the state, and he's not really uh, apologetic about it. I mean, he says, you know, I have to take the reins of the state, and I have to impose the structure of the state to the Tunisians, and I have to persuade them. And this is something you find in these discourses uh, all the time. This, this, this speech is as an enterprise of persuasion and really getting into the hearts of uh, of Tunisians. And there are anecdotes about, about couples fighting, uh, about invading, and women saying, but you know, Sibur, Silah Bib said, I could take it off. You know, and as soon as she would say Silah Bib, everybody would say, of course. Right? <laughs> so it's, it's, and he would say sometimes, well, don't interpret my, 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 my speeches too literally. You know, Silah Bib said yes, but you have also to think by yourself. So, so he was very, very aware of uh, his own uh, charismatic power and sometimes used it a little bit uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that people didn't like very much either. So um, just so, so this, this idea that he would talk about himself as someone who is persuasive. So his, his, uh, his power is really at that time uh, affirmed. Um, and for instance, he says, I know that in this same speech, I know that my words are listened to, that they have an effect, and that my directives are followed. So there was no discussion about that. And um, at the end of the speech, he introduces uh, the issue of women under the rubric of social problems. He says, I'm going to talk to you about social problems, and then comes the question of women in the day. And um, like Haddad, um, this is not about religion, but it's about customs wrongly attributed to Islam. And this is what he says about unveiling. We have been informed of satisfying progress in the movement that liberates the Tunisian women from the veil. Nonetheless, it seems that there is still some resistance. I would like the public opinion to understand exactly what our aim is with this reform. Statistics reveal that sex cases are decreasing. It is remarkable that the cases that are still occurring precisely only implicate those young women who are raised within traditional biases and in seclusion. Unquote. So like Hadel, he links the wearing of the veil with immorality and devotion. And this is something you find in Hadel also in many passages, that the veil allows for hiding, and for doing things you know, behind, behind the veil. <laughs> so, so he has the same idea, that, which is going to be completely inversed by the Islamists later, yeah. which is that the veil, of course, is what protects the morality and the virtue of women. And he says, and this is why I bring this, I bring this speech, he says in the end of the speech that the veil is, and I quote, a horrible lad that has nothing to do with religion. And this is very well known, so I, you know, these are the, the mythical, uh, for the, the so-called secularists in Tunisia, for instance, a very important uh, reference, of course. Uh, and this is why also the veil, when it comes back later, is going to be emotionally experienced by, uh, by the Bulgarians. But what is interesting is that unveiling was not imposed through a law. Because he could have gone also towards that and, and, and uh, uh, publish a law or have it voted, even if he sometimes didn't need to have things voted, but just impose them. But in 1981, there was a circular, a, a manchur, um, that uh, in fact uh, uh, prevented women to wear uh, the veil in, um, in sports. So the way before it happened. Uh, but it was not what is interesting too, and, and this is I think something that is worth thinking about, um, is that it was not applied very, cons very systematically. It was applied when needed. So it was applied when the Islamists started to appear on campuses, when Bugiba wanted to make a gesture against them or, or oppose them like at a certain moment, he would just apply the circular, right? So again, it was used in a very, very unsystematic way. He also, um, for, for, for uh, Bungiba speeches, uh, the personal status for the legal change was not, was not enough. And, and he also talked about coercion. Uh, in the same speech, he said, 
We understand the repugnance of aged women to abandon a long habit, but we can only regret the obstinacy of parents who constrain young women to wear the veil to go to school. We even see civil servants to go to work rigged in this horrible rag. We continuously repeat that it is abandoned in Muslim countries and it has nothing to do with religion, and quote. And here he says, I'm not going to quote again, it's uh, not too much time, he says, you know, at some point I'll have to do something about it. I'm going to coerce you. But the coercion never really happened. And so the ambivalence of the state regarding the faith is, um, is quite um, interesting. So there is an ambiguous mix of persuasion and coercion in working by trying to make women, and this is most visible in the scenes that um, were um, shot, um, filmed uh, in a documentary on the subject of emancipation of women uh, in Tunisia that was transmitted on French television in 1968. And this was filmed in 1967. So it's quite amazing that in 1967, Bukiba is going out during the Journée de la Femme, Yom and Mara, and dating women in towns uh, and being filmed, and this was uh, retransmitted on television. And uh, it's a 15 minute black and white film that was uh, made by French uh, um, television people, so it's made for the French public. So that is also interesting because the way they translate the whole process of invading in the, the, the French context uh, is, uh, is interesting, but we see different types of women in the documentary. We see Bedouin women wearing only a foulard, a um, head uh, scarf, and then we see women uh, filmed at the Palace of Carthage because it's the women that come and they are received in a big reception by Bourguiba and they all wear very uh, short dresses, sleeveless dresses. So these are the bourgeois. Uh, of Tunis, the elite of Tunis, um, says the narrator in the documentary, it's not me. <laughs> and then um, you see also women in Tafseri uh, being unveiled by Bukiba. And when you look very closely at the film, because I had never seen anything like this, that was young. Uh, and uh, when you look at the film, it's very interesting to just look at the details of the unveiling. Um, first, I, I assume you all know what the Tafseri is, uh, and it's a quite uh, flexible piece of, of white uh, cotton or silk that is um, um, hold, so it covers the whole body, it, it's held at the waist, and you wrap it under yourself, and, uh, over your head. But the thing is, it's very difficult to keep it all the time wrapped on your head, and you hold it either with your hand or with your teeth. <laughs> and, but that's true, and, and so it's a very, it is impractical, and for instance, women who work in the fields never wear the because they have work. work. So in the rural world, there's no hijab, I mean, there is very colored uh, um, head scarves, but nothing else. And, and these women could either wrap uh, the piece of material over the lower part of the face, or just leave it open like this, right? So there was quite a lot of flexibility in the way they would uh, cover themselves. And at that time, it is really the Sefseri that comes um, under the eye of Bukiba. It's not any them anymore. I mean, you see, you, you see in the streets of Tunisia, purely fans, but it's almost disappeared. Like you see the, the, the Sefseri at that time. And so um, what you see in the, in the movie is Bukiba unveiling, approaching, first he embraces, he really kisses, uh, the women, the Bedouin women, but also the, the women in Tafseri, who, who, who go toward him very, very easily. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, it seems to be very spontaneous, even if there is a lot of policemen around. Uh, <laughs> and he unveils them, and there is a woman who, and the camera stays a long time, he unveils her, and it's very easy to do, because there are no pains, nothing. And she puts it back, she's a little bit embarrassed, she puts it back, and he comes back, and he re unveils her. And then he unveils other women. And I think this gesture, there is a silent exchange between this woman and Liba, and you can see the soft coercion at play over there. And I think this is a very interesting um, moment that, that would need more, more commentary uh, on our part, but, but I think it's an interesting way to look at pedagogies of the state, um, and to look at how the state reasons, but also acts um, in regard to Islam. OK, 
Okay, so I'm not going to, I'm going to skip a lot of things, Please. and I, 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 I'm going to look at these artists now, the, the third phase. Um, and as you know, in the end of the 1970s, a new type of veil appeared in Tunisia, which had nothing to do with the Sassari or uh, the traditional ways of veiling. Uh, so it was not the face veil that Bourguiba was criticizing, but it was the hijab we know today that has standardized uh, in, the, in the world uh, with processes of globalization. Mm -hmm. And obviously it was not worn as an instrument of seclusion or separation. It was worn um, as a way to dress for men, women who went out in the public sphere. And this is why it became so visible, just because it was done while going out. And these women were not just going out for five minutes to buy a piece of bread or a gallon of milk, but simply to go to work and study. So it was a new version of religiosity, um, and it was not associated uh, anymore um, necessarily with women who did not go to school, who were ignorant, who were only rural women, or uh, women in, in cities who were secluded. It was another type of, um, of behavior that was signaled by, uh, by the veil. And I know that there are a lot of works on the veil, and there are many ways to understand what the veil means, uh, a way to discipline oneself into piety, as Abba Mahmoud has shown very well an instrument for emancipation for other thinkers and researchers, and a tool for patriarchal reproduction. And I'm not going to to try to give, I, I think this is very, very complex, as Mohammed Arkin has said earlier, and very, very motivated. So I'm not interested in giving my own uh, explanation of, or my own um, interpretation of the veil, but rather to look at how different political elites have looked at it. What justification, what reasons do they give? for the veil or not the veil. And um, of course, the, the, the uh, Tunisian state uh, right away looked at the veil as, in the 70s, uh, the end of the 70s and the 80s, as an instrument of political contestation, of political opposition. It's not the case anymore. But at that time, we were like, you know, right after the Iranian revolution. And uh, Rashid al on his part, wrote uh, in the 70s and the 80s several articles, and one of them is called The Woman in the Islamic Movement. And what is interesting in Ranouchi's text is that he develops a critique of submission of women that's very, very similar to that of Burki Bethadda. So for him, women have to be educated, they have to be full, they have to open up to knowledge. Right? It's a very similar type um, of discourse with the addition of an anti-capitalistic and anti-imperialist discourse, right? The way our women dress is linked to westernization and capitalism, consumption, you know. They want to buy lipstick, and they want to buy this and that, and they want to look good. This is not what is important. What is important is the morality and the dignity of women. And in, in a way, he, he reappropriates many of the tropes or uses many of the tropes used before him by uh, other reformers uh, that are so-called secularist um, reformers. And so for him, um, the, the main problem is that Tunisia has lost its personality. So we're going back to Bouguba. It has lost its personality and, should, and, and it has lost its traditions. So here you have an inversion with Bouguba. You have two inversions with Bouguba. First, Bouguba was anchored in the West. It was anchored in the French culture. So that's one difference. And the second difference is Bougiba hated everything that was traditional. With the taqalids and the, 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 those customs. You know, he said it was, it was uh, useless for him. You know, it was not in the path towards what he called progress and civilization. While for Ranoshi, the tradition is the personality. So here you have two, you have a, a, an opposition um, between them. But both of them wanted to build what they call an authentic shahsiya, personality. Um, and um, I think it's important to underline that both Bourguiba and um, some of the Islamists really had this desire to mold the personality of the nation. And I think Bourguiba used Islam to do that in a different way, in a completely different way. But he, he really relied on Islam to build also what he called the personality of um, Tunisia, and, um, and Bourguiba relied on what he called the disciplines of the heart. And Islam as, you know, this disciplines of the heart, he said in, 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 
in a speech that he gave uh, to the, uh, the New National Defense Museum, he said, uh, you have to discipline your heart. You cannot do whatever you want, right? So you can wear, you, you should not wear the veil, but you know, don't go too far. And you should take care of your kids. So you, have, you are an educator before anything else. And so this discipline of the heart is, of course, defined differently in Ramushi and, and, uh, and Burkiba, but they both rely also on interpretation of Islam, what it says and what it doesn't say to uh, talk about molding the personality for uh, the nation. So um, I don't have too much time, but um, and um, talk about his vision of what he calls the Zay Islam. Right? Um, he writes um, in the 70s again, um, about the Zay Islam, and this is what he says. He says it's a long dress and a head color. He, um, but he also, he also um, criticizes the Islamic movement saying that it is a mistake, and I told him, he thinks that you only need little changes, such as long dresses and the abandoning of lipstick, to become an Islamic society. Right? So he also recognizes that there, in a way, is a detail. It's not what mm -hmm. counts. And he writes, Islam does not interact with women by talking to them about their dresses, length, or width, but rather, it is interested in the woman's vision of life and what this vision leads her towards. And this is very Hadadian and very good. To change the vision of women, to open up women towards the, towards the world in very different ways. So I'm not saying they, they have the exact same conception of women, but the idea is really to open up this vision that the woman has on her world. So there is a reformist intent and there is a, um, an opening towards the world and knowledge that is very, very important in both of them. For instance, Ramushi talks about um, the elevation of women. And this is very good given. We have to elevate. And I don't understand what does it mean to elevate us, to elevate us where? You know? and so there is, there is even in the vocabulary this idea that there, these men are going to be defined for the Tunisian women where we can stand higher. Um, and, and this is very similar in. Um, in Urgiva and, and Ranushi, and they both use the, the comparison between bestiality and humanity. Uh, Urgiva used a lot um, this idea that progress and, and using Islam to progress was a way to get out of what he called a bestiality, a humanity. And, and Ranushi does exactly the same thing. The veil is a way to go from uh, animality to uh, humanity. Right. So they completely disagree on the veil when it presents, but they have the exact same kind of understanding. Um, so I think for both of them to change female subjectivity was their aim. And of course they don't, they see this subjectivity happening and, and, and being expressed in different ways, but this is what was important for them. And I think we. In the research of the, in political science and social science, it is usually um, what the state says or what state elites say about their subjects is often marginalized because we think, well, this is propaganda, it's not interesting, it's very superficial, but I think it's not. I think these speeches, these actions, have a very, very important effect on all of us. And I think the, the Islamist movement, this, this oppositional movement, is in fact molded by the Bulgarian discourse already. It's not coming from outside. We analyze very often Islamist movements as you know, coming from um, the margins. Uh, it is the result of economic uh, phenomena and employment dissatisfaction, and that's probably true. This content is produced by uh, uh, opposition and resistance are produced by this content, by economic problems. But then why the religious vocabulary? 
why the theological reason is. So for, for many political scientists, this obvious movement come back suddenly. As the retour de l'Islam, the revival, etc. But in fact, the Islamist tropes are already present in state discourses. So we cannot analyze Islamist discourse from coming out of the periphery from nowhere. We have to link them to reformist movements. And I think the 19th century is very important. I went back to Don Chappell, but I think earlier would be even more important. And Bourguiba was very much influenced by reformist movements too. And so I think the Islamist movement, in a way, is the point of the iceberg, if you want to analyze Islam is what we call the Islamist revival, which I think is not a revival. <coughs> of course, it's a change, it's a transformation, but um, it has roots in things that happened um, much earlier, and it's not necessarily to be linked and related to dysfunctions. It is part of a long history. And um, so that's, um, for me, in a way, I use the veil as a as a pretext to try to build this argument. Um, and I did not, I know we had a conversation about the day yesterday, and I still don't have an explanation for it. I don't have a, a, a causality to give you. Uh, but what I know is that in fact, this contention is not old, um, and uh, that the continuities uh, between these old phenomena, all these forces, and what the post-colonial state uh, does and says, and the Islamic position are to be uh, described, and must be described, for us to understand better what um, Islamist uh, movements are. Um, so I'll just, um, I'll just stop here. Uh, <coughs> Ma Monica, thank you very much. Um, especially maybe more interested in Tunisia, and I'll talk to you about that later again. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got, we've, we're running short of time, so we have three quick questions and we need to get to the break. Thank you for an extremely illuminating, interesting, and well-documented paper. And my question is, couldn't some of the things Bogiba said, and his speeches and the, the, the outline them, be explained by him trying to win over some of the ulama, what he wanted to do? Yeah. Uh, and this is linked with, with the second remark. In the Mashrik, the nightmare of many Ulama was Kemal mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And the question is, was there sort of a picture of Kemal Atatürk in the Ulama's mind? And they, we, we are not going to go to do this at all because yeah. we know what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. These are very um, important questions. The relationship of Bogiba with the Ulama, I mean, on the veil, he didn't try much win. Um, and, and he didn't do it with that. And this is what is interesting about the veil. On other things, he really tried to um, mobilize the ulama around him. I don't know if you remember, but in the middle of the 60s, he asked the Tunisians to stop fasting during Ramadan to win the economic jihad. So he used the word jihad, by the way. And he has, and I have another chapter where he, um, in which I describe how he talks about Islam and the maqasid, uh, Sharia, in order to say, well, you know, Ramadan is not just about not eating, it's about working harder, right? And, uh, and in Kairawan, of course, a more conservative uh, city, uh, Sheikh Abdurrahman Khalil proposed him uh, very, very violently and said, you know, we have to fast and we have to work. So the Puritanism was, in a way, you know, we doubled. Uh, but so, and so other ulama, like the Ben Ashurs, were brought with within the circle of Bogiba, they were domesticated on certain things, but not on others. For instance, Sheikh Jahayet was, uh, in the beginning, in agreement with Bogiba about Ramadan, and then when he asked him, now you have to give me a fatwa, he said, I can't do that. You know, so it's very interesting to look at these uh, relationships of negotiation, of rapprochement, but also, you know, how am I going to do in front of my colleagues, if I'm going to write a fatwa again, you know, saying it's, it's okay not to fast, right? So, and, and you know, Ibn Baz wrote a fatwa against Bukhiba, because Bukhiba in the 70s wanted to change the inheritance law, and he said he was careful and apostate, and so on. So, so the, the relationship with the Orema is very interesting, uh, very, very interesting. But not all of them uh, opposed him. Um, so there were some of them who, who, who were part also of this enterprise. It was a whole enterprise of persuasion, and they probably also gained resources and some sort of uh, political capital, too. So there are many reasons why they oppose him or, or not. Um, 
Now, Atatürk is very interesting. Um, so, we, in Turkey, all of this happens much earlier in the 20s. And when you look at how Nasser, Ugiba, but also the, the Moroccan monarchy, um, looked at the question of religious institutions and the ulama after their independence, they all looked at the Atatürk experience. Um, and they were all inspired by it. And at the same time, they, they did not do the same thing, of course. And Burgiba, in particular, always said, you know, Atatürk did what he did, and I disagree with him, he went too far. Right? But at the same time, you find in Burgiba and Nasser, in the republics, not in the monarchy, but in the republics, the exact same pattern of institutional reforms, which is reform of religious institutions of learning, um, reforms of the Habun Sarkar, nationalization, because as we know Atatürk did not make all of this disappear, he just made, made it very, very small and appropriated it, so that it disappeared, <coughs> right? It remained under the purview of the state, an authoritarian one. Um, and then um, legal courts. And the dress code. And the dress code, of course, in Atatürk, which, which would be that. So you, you see, it's, it's amazing, the patterns are at the same time, there is a transportability or a translatability of all these policies, it's not just concepts, it's policies that are, and, and what I think, you know, it's very hard to go into the archives of the Tunisian government. I mean, it's maybe in, in 100 years we'll be able to look at things. But, you know, there were discussions, and, and, and uh, of course, Bugiba was very authoritarian, but there were discussions going back and forth, and it would be wonderful if we could have more access to what happened, but uh, um, I'm, re I, I'm currently looking at the uh, drafting assembly for a constitution, very interesting debates about the place of Islam within the constitution, women, so here you have a, a wealth of, of information that can help us understand state pedagogies and state justifications and reasonings about religion, um, and, um, and the parliamentary debates also, uh, very interesting, very, very interesting. Is it time? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. Professor, you the Yes, uh, there is uh, so much to tell. Uh, first of all, Bogiba uh, is one of my uh, references as a case study for all the problems in which we are swimming, as I say. Uh, since uh, the beginning of the uh, states in all Muslim countries, uh, uh, the, the same situation. The situation is we have here an example of a person, Tunisian, who got the culture of the Third French Republic. The Third French Republic is the one that has built the republic in which we are now. <coughs> Just by the, the, the decision of the education that has been made in Pansu, Gratis, free, 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 the state, place, and, and the most important, late. Late is more than secular. It's much more. And Paul Biba was intellectually cool. But he, he had this attitude that you described just by political strategy, not because of his conviction as an intellectual of the Third Republic. But being an intellectual of the Third Republic, even in Algeria, in Morocco, in, in North Africa, where French were, were present for for more than 100 years. It is extremely difficult to run a state. Why? Because the majority of people are living under the pressure. I would never say this. Never. Personally, I am from Kabylia, you told me. We didn't hear at all about any kind of what we call today Sharia. It's a large part of Algeria. Never. We didn't have any Qadi, 
touch. We didn't have any kind of mahkama. We didn't have any of those components of what we call Islam. We were just a part of African continent with animist tradition, animist practices, rituals, beliefs. I had grown up in this situation. So you see the discrepancy for one person or some persons, let's say, 100, uh, uh, 1,000 in a society where Islam, of course, in Tunisia and Morocco, there is some difference when you compare with Algeria, because you have, you have uh, Zituna and you have uh, 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 that introduced some what? Which kind of Islam was represented in these two so-called universities? I give you just an image to, to, to go quickly. When we compare the figure of Kant, Emmanuel Kant, in Europe, what Kant produced in Europe, what is the contribution of Kant to the total change of what we call reason, his big books, raison pure, raison humble. And you compare this to a contemporary of Kant, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. <laughs> they have all, they live absolutely contemporary. What was happening in, in Europe, not only with Kant, I mentioned Kant because he's a major figure, who changed the, re the, the, the human reason. Totally. And what Muhammad ibn Abdullah feared. <laughs> He was ignorant of what has happened to Islamic thought, Islamic thinking, Islamic pluralism. Uh, in the beginning, what, what you call for this is deep. <clears throat> he didn't represent even the school of Ibn Hanbal. The school of Ibn Hanbal in the 12th and 13th century, they were a kind of humanist, <clears throat> religious humanist, open to all the knowledge which, which was available in the 13th century. All this doesn't exist in his mind. He's a man who had some so you have here a picture of the kind of Islam that was expanding, uh, what was living, the li the lived Islam. Lived Islam in this frame totally cut from Islamic tradition as we know it in the formative period kind of freedom, and in the classical period when the Aqidah was constructed as an orthodox Aqidah that you have to obey. So we have to have in mind these historical references. In the mind of Gurkiba either, he, he didn't know what I'm saying with his culture. That's why he could turn totally to modernity. But he couldn't make it openly because he, he was a, a political le le leader. He knows his people. He knows his society. So we have to, to think and to analyze all this to understand the actors of that moment. You, you say, well, what's his relation with Ulama? I, Ulama didn't know more than him and him. He, he, they were on the same level about what? Islam has been, not since 18th century, but it, it started to be did to regress to, the, 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 to what I call dogmatic closures since 13th, 14th century. We have to have this picture in mind. So now, the example of Borgiba is extremely important because, because he did something nevertheless. For all his first decisions, he did it without referring, as you say, uh, uh, Nigeria, 
present the face because it had a solidarity with colonial with colonial system. Modernity has never sh- show, uh, shown has never shown this engagement for a universal thinking, a universal touch. So we didn't see this. We, s- we saw modernity in solidarity with, with the colonial system. So we had to resist. That is a point, very important, for a political leader to bring back. But to bring back what? There is no Islam. Intellectual Islam is not there at all. You cannot bring it. You have to cope with a, with a beliefs that are uh, polytheist beliefs, animist beliefs. This was the situation. Everywhere. Everywhere. Including uh, in Turkey, because Turkey is a small movement, and one leader who had the courage to go up, but this courage was not built, rooted in any kind of culture that could support this uh, this jump from an Islam that was unable to give you anything to build a state and a modernity that ignored you and that was in solidarity with the colonial system and continued to be in solidarity with all the immigration itself. This is the situation that, that is not yet analyzed, that is not, if, if it is not analyzed, how a professor who would think, who would teach this period and explain what the, 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 this example, for example, of, of Bourguiba, to explain it to the generation after the independence. We do not have trained teachers aware of what I'm saying about history of Islamic thought, the absence of all what has been built intellectually in terms uh, of theology, of philosophy, of knowledge, etc., and even humanism. We don't, we don't have until now. That's why. We are in a worse, much worse situation. In the time of Burkiba, all the Maghreb was looking to Tunisia, was looking to to, 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 to Burkiba, because in the world there was still uh, Mohammed uh, Hamis, he's a man of the 19th century. But he belonged, he belonged to that Islam I mentioned with Abdel Wahab. No one must even the, if he is a, a, a sultan, could have access to this inversions, inversion, inversion, inversion of temporalities, I call it like this, in the itinerary of Islam since the Middle Ages, compared to the itinerary of Europe, because Islam lost all its Glory is past, less past. No, no contact with it. Why in Europe they started with the total energy, total euphoria since the Renaissance to go for modern religion without any discontinuity? And when we look to the situation in the whole Mediterranean area, why we are in this situation? It is total separation from the north and the south of the Mediterranean. Because of that situation, that is not yet uh, known. To, to make it known to the generations, now we are totally under the pressure of what I call institutionalized ignorance. Institution, yes, it is now structured. The type of Islam on which we are speaking is totally built on the ignorance of the self. 
ignorance of the self. In terms of history, what has happened to these societies? Thank you. Very much, Professor. We will do it. Thank you very much, Monica.